Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the founder and editor of the New Books Network, and you're about to hear an interview with somebody I admire very much. His name is Andy Hunter. Andy founded bookshop.org. Now, I love bookstores, and you probably love bookstores, but you know that bookstores have been in trouble recently for various reasons, which I probably don't need to explain. What Andy and his team at bookshop.org have done is found a way to support brick-and-mortar bookstores by donating a certain amount of the money they make when you buy books on bookshop.org to brick-and-mortar bookstores. So what this does is funnel some of the money that you spend buying books online to your local bookshop. When I I found out about bookshop.org several years ago, I was amazed to begin with, and I was very pleased that somebody had taken on this mission, that mission being to help the bookstores in your local community survive and thrive. And that's what Andy and the team at bookshop.org have done. He explains the origins of bookshop.org, how it works, and how you can buy books there and help support local bookstores. Enjoy the interview. I'm Caleb Zachern, assistant editor of the New Books Network. Today, I'm speaking with Andy Hunter, founder and CEO of Bookshop.org. Bookshop.org is an online book retailer that shares profits with independent bookstores. Since 2020, they've raised over $27 million, or 80% of their profit margin for independent bookstores. You may be familiar with Bookshop.org because every single book on the New Books Network is linked to Bookshop.org. What Andy and his team has done is nothing short of a miracle. Andy, thanks for joining me today on the New Books Network. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Of course, you know, as I said, we're, we're, we're massive fans of bookshop.org and we, th- I think that, that what you're doing is, is just really exciting for, for the book world. I'm a big uh, fan of, of I, I live in New York, so I, I go to bookstores literally all the time. It's, it's a bit of an addiction, um, but you've really created a great way for people to access bookstores, especially, you know, in times like the pandemic where you can't go to them, but you still want to support your, your local bookstore. But Before talking about Bookshop, I was just wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your life before Bookshop.org. You know, when I was a kid, I was a huge reader. Um, I had, uh, like a lot of huge readers, kind of a difficult home and a difficult um, social life. And um, I found solace in books. And I also, you know, I just loved the experience of reading and I loved the worlds that reading opened up to me. Um, And... I really do believe that books saved my life. Like books are something that I have a, have a huge debt to, not just in my understanding of myself, my understanding of the world, and just the way I navigated my my youth and adolescence. Books were were critical, and so so I cared deeply about them. And I used to fantasize about one day I would just live in a bookstore. I would own a bookstore and sleep in the back room. Like that was my childhood dream. Uh, which I still have yet to fulfill. Um, And it it took me a while to get into books as a career. I self-published a a scrappy little indie magazine in my 20s. Um, And at the same time, for for a living, I was working doing IT. I ended up getting into development and learning how to code. I actually got a temp job at Disney working getting $12 an hour. And I was sitting next to somebody that was getting paid $150 an hour and he was programming. And so I'm like, I really got to learn how to program, which is like now a huge like internet meme cliche. But I was in fact a writer who wanted to work in the arts and learned how to code. And then I had a few years that I thought were lost years where I was doing like software development for big corporations like Disney and MGM. And then I really just wanted to write and edit and work in publishing and media. Um, but I was still self-publishing my magazine and eventually my magazine got the attention of people who actually published magazines. And then I got a job as a editor in chief of, of a small indie publication out of Los Angeles through that. And for years I thought that it was this bizarre anomaly that I learned how to code and I kind of rose the ranks in these, um, it departments of these big corporations. Um, and that I felt like that was kind of a wasted three years or so, but then it turned out that they were extremely, it was extremely useful to know how to code and it's extremely useful to know about digital development and platforms in general, if you're going into a world like the literary world that really doesn't have that expertise and that 
honestly has a lot of aversions towards it. Like people don't really like technology. A lot of people in books don't really like it and feel threatened by it. And so, so it ended up that my, my knowledge there was, it was a huge advantage for me and it allowed me to do a lot of things I've done. Um, so, so I worked in magazines for about 10 years and then I got an MFA at Brooklyn College, worked with Michael Cunningham and um, Susan Choi and um, Jenny Offal and other great writers there. And um, then I started Electric Literature, which was my first like entrepreneurial venture, um, which is still going strong today. And then I started um, pu- working as a publisher at Catapult, Counterpoint, and Soft Skull. And I co-founded the website Literary Hub separately with uh, Morgan Entrican from Grove Atlantic Press. And so by that point, I had been in publishing for maybe six, seven years. And I was really concerned with how Amazon was kind of eating the whole industry. I could see the squeeze that they were putting on publishers. I could see how the do- their dominance in the market was kind of homogenizing books and creating a winner-take-all environment. And they were also a very winner take all minded retailer. Um, and I particularly didn't want them taking all from small presses, from diverse writers, and I didn't want them taking all from independent local bookstores. And so I decided to try to get people to back um, Bookshop, which was originally conceived of as a way for independent bookstores to kind of fight back against Amazon and um, sell books online. And for independent bookstore lovers like me to be able to easily support local bookstores when they were shopping online. And that's um, kind of where I ended up. And um, that's how Bookshop got started. Was there a moment of epiphany for Bookshop? Or was it this sort of slow build where over time you realized that something like Bookshop would be necessary for the book world to survive? There's a, there was a few key moments. Um, in 2011, I, when Amazon was maybe 15% of books sold, now they're probably 65%. Um, and I saw how fast they were growing and I'm like, there should be some indie version of this that should be sort of a collective. And so like every, like online shopping isn't going to go away and this is going to end up becoming the way that most people get their books. And so we should have a version that kind of supports the culture and that isn't owned by the private corporation that doesn't have our interests at heart because... Um, books, as everybody who listens to podcasts knows, are extremely important cultural objects that have really done more than anything else to um, enhance the the trajectory of humanity. Like the books are um, how civilization has progressed, and how you know if if the arc of civilization does bend towards justice, a lot of it is that a lot of that happens because of books and and the ideas in books and and how we understand ourselves, our past, our history, our culture, et cetera. So that they're not just widgets. And so they shouldn't be treated as widgets. And um, so it bothered me that Amazon, who treated them like widget, was winning. And the independent local bookstores who are invested in books on a very human level and have dedicated their lives to books, um, they were losing. And so... My first epiphany was in 2011 when I wanted to create an indie version of Amazon. I went to a bunch of um, organizations like the Ford Foundation to see if, like, is this something somebody would fund? And the answer was absolutely not. Like, nobody was interested in funding anything that was like, oh, this is a store? It's like an online bookstore? Like, no way. way. That doesn't make sense. And so I gave that idea up. And then in 2018, seven years later, I was sitting next to um, Christine Honorati, who runs Word Bookstores in Greenpoint and um, Jersey City, and she was on the board of directors of the American Bookseller Association, and she's like, hey, you know, we've got this program called IndieBound that's supposed to be helping us compete with Amazon, but it's really not working, and we need somebody who really understands the internet and does good work to help us, so will you, like, consult with us and help us and figure out how to improve IndieBound? And that made me start thinking about like, well, what would I do? Like, how would I actually make IndieBound work and, and do what it's supposed to do? And um, I put it in the back of my mind for about three months. And then I was on a business trip and I was staying at an Airbnb in Berkeley, California. And my 
I've got two young kids, so they weren't around to um, you know distract me. And I just sat down and had a few beers and wrote out all of these ideas. And um, and that original document is almost exactly what Bookshop was. Like what I wrote down that one night for four hours um, is pretty much what Bookshop ended up being. So you know, after that, you know that that evening where you, where you put it, you started to put it all together. You know, what was the early days like of Bookshop.org? Because it seems to me that you know you started working on it and then it just took off immediately. It almost seems seems like that. So, but I imagine that that they couldn't have been what it was like. There must have been you know months and months of you know slow grinding. Is this going to work out? So, so what was that period of time like for you? Yeah, well. It's it's a very like lonely and sometimes feels Sisyphean uh, process to try to start something like Bookshop. In the beginning, I, I wrote out all my ideas, you know, and I went to the ABA, and their first answer was, "No, we can't do this because we're a trade organization, so we can't sell books, so this isn't going to work." And then, so then I had that defeat, even though I thought it was a really good idea. So then I went back to them two months later, being like, "If I start this as a company." Will you partner with me? And so it's not you doing it, but it's me doing it, and we can partner. And then, and they were like, ah, uh, and thank God they said yes. And they also offered to invest in it. And so then I had my first investor, and I had the partnership of this huge trade organization. So that was great. And then I went with that to create like a deck and a business plan. And I started going to investors, and nobody would invest. Um, I just would get rejection after rejection, and people would say things like, Competing with Amazon is not a business plan. And American consumers only care about speed and price. And so if you can't beat them on those two things, then you can't beat Amazon on speed and price, you're doomed. And luckily, Morgan Entrican, who I had built LitHub with, thought he didn't think it would ever be as big as it is now. He thought it would be about one fifth of the size that we are now. Um, but it was a promising enough and a good enough cause that he's like, okay, I'll invest. And I have some friends who I think love bookstores as much as me and they'll invest. So Morgan helped me put together a group of investors and um, of the seven people that ended up investing, five of them came from Morgan. So it was really, he was a really important part of making that happen. It took me overall about a year from when the, I came up with the idea to when I had all the investors lined up um, to start building it. And even then I had only raised $750,000, which if you're broke your whole life, which I have been, um, that seems like a lot of money. But if you're trying to compete with Amazon and launch a new like global web business, it's actually a tiny amount of money. So I was trying to raise over a million, um, but eventually I just gave up and said, we're just going to try to build this with what the money we've got because... Um, I felt like the clock was ticking and time was running out. Um, Amazon had surpassed 50% of book sales in the U S at that point. And I knew consumer habits, like once they're set, they're set. It'd be really hard to come back from it. If Amazon reached like 70%, and we launched it in three years, like it would just be extremely hard. So I felt this urgency and I'm like, we're going to build this as fast as we can. We're going to launch it as fast as we can. And then in the end, that seems extremely prescient because we launched it in January 28th of 2020 and the pandemic hit six weeks later. So six weeks after we launched it, all these bookstores had to close and they couldn't even have their employees come in for online orders to fulfill online orders because that wasn't safe. And they often did not have any kind of digital storefronts either. So they couldn't sell books online. So within like the first month of bookshop, we sold about $50,000 worth of books. We got some good press. We got some people who were skeptical. Um, and then mid-March, suddenly we started onboarding 1,200 bookstores. And we went from doing $50,000 worth of books in a month to, to 150,000 worth of books in a day. And so it was really the pandemic that made, it kind of accelerated everything like online sales and e-commerce was going to be important for bookstores over the next decade, no matter what, but suddenly it became important to them like immediately. And so it helped us really onboard and, and get up to speed very fast. And it also, you know, thank God we did because really 
hundreds of bookstores have told us that they wouldn't have survived the pandemic if Bookshop hadn't been there. And at this point in time, you mentioned 1,200 in that period of time, but but currently as it stands, do, do you know about the number of independent bookstores that are currently associated with Bookshop in some capacity? Yeah, it's 1,900 stores, and there's um, about 2,400 stores total in the ABA. So that's about 80% of the bookstores in the U.S. Um, are on Bookshop. And, you know, I imagine there, that there are people listening to this uh, right now that that either work in book, you know, might work in bookstores or have some association. So if they wanted to support their local bookstore, but also use, use Bookshop, uh, how can they do that? Is there, or, or how can they get their independent bookstore involved if they're not already involved? Yeah. Well, if he, the first thing to do is just go to bookshop.org and there's a store finder in the upper right-hand corner. It will say, choose a bookstore and you can put in your zip code or you can just browse a map. Like it's kind of fun to actually browse a map of the United States and click into all these different stores. Like you can find the store that's in the remotest part of Alaska, which seems super cute. They've got a page on Bookshop and you can support them for a month and then you can support a different one like your local bookstore, et cetera. So you have a lot of flexibility and you can find all of these interesting bookstores. And also the great thing about Bookshop is that they curate their own lists so you can find all these incredible aggregations of books based on that bookseller's interests, whether it's, you know, dark sci-fi, post-apocalyptic fantasy, or, you know, summer romances or super heavy, like literary fiction. Um, you can find all of this stuff and it's all human curated. And so it's much, much more interesting than the kind of discovery that you'd have on Amazon. Um, so that's the easiest way to find a bookstore to support is just go to choose a, choose a bookstore, or you can browse like our homepage where we're going to be featuring various lists that bookstores have created. Um, if your books, if you know a bookstore that you really want to support and they're not on Bookshop, just you know, just encourage them to join. There's probably one of two reasons: they're either not really into technology, maybe they're luddites, and I totally respect that. I think that technology is extremely problematic and and, I'm, and it makes a lot of sense to be a Luddite. Um, in those cases, I would just try to encourage them because it's so easy. We've basically made bookshops so easy that anybody who can type can create a bookshop page in like a half an hour and that's all they have to do. And And so just make sure that your bookstore knows how simple it is. And then the other ones are, you know, there are bookstores who are still a little skeptical of bookshop. Fortunately, there's not that many anymore. Um, but in those cases, like if a book, if a bookstore is like, yeah, I've heard about it, but I don't know, like I would rather do my own thing. Then I would just encourage them to talk to us because we're, we're very open about, um, what we're doing and our finances and everything else like that. We're a certified B corporation and we're actually voted or we were evaluated by the B, B labs. And they said that we were in the top 5% of B corps worldwide in terms of our impact on society and our, our ethics and our rules and the way that we do business. So, um, so we're super proud of that. And hopefully that will, would reassure anybody that was like a little bit scared to join bookshop. For those who don't know, B corps are corporations that put social and environmental objectives above simply just profit making. Uh, and it's a whole community of companies and investors that operate together. Is that, is that more or less accurate? Yeah, absolutely. As you said before that, you know, just the, the initial challenge of just raising this money and going to different people and getting, getting those rejections. Uh, but I imagine also going from 50,000 to, uh, you know, I think you're doing, you're doing tens of millions of, of, uh, dollars or of, uh, a, a month. You know, what, what, were there any challenges in just getting the website up and running? Like that sounds like you must the website must have been, you know, on the edge of crashing all the time. So, what, you know, what were some of the other challenges you faced? It, it was the most insane period of my life. I'll try to do it justice. Basically, you know, we thought we were going to launch a beta website in January, and then we needed to get it up and like get it good by the holiday season of that year. So we thought we had about eight months to work out all the bugs, make it good. In the beginning, we didn't have even have shipping confirmations. Like people who bought books didn't even get their tracking numbers. We had four people working and we were working out of the 
conference room of the baffler and i don't know if all your listeners know but the baffler is like this is a niche socialist kind of a reverent socialist magazine it's been around for a long time they're awesome people and they just let us work out of their conference room and so we were tiny and i had a full-time day job um and then when the pandemic hit suddenly i was working from home i had my day job I'm also working as publisher of Lit Hub, which is another external job, and I'm doing bookshop. And I've got both of my little kids who are suddenly have to work, have to do school from home. So they're doing Zooms. My apartment was 450 square feet, the family of four, all of whom are working from home. Luckily, my wife is an artist, so she could go to the studio. And, um, and then my landlord, who wanted to get rid of all of his tenants because he was a rent-stabilized bu building, and wanted to convert it from being rent stabilized, decided that he was going to lower the basement floor by uh, two feet. So he was in the basement jackhammering every single day, starting at like seven in the morning to eight o'clock at night. And it was the most insanely stressful time period of my life. And just keeping the site going would require us to work like until midnight, 2 a.m., get up at five, so I was extremely sleep deprived, doing homeschool, doing all this stuff. And every single day, I was like, I cannot do this for another day. Every day when I went to bed, I'm like, I can't survive this. Um, but somehow in those three months, we managed to go from four people to being about 24 people. Um, somehow we managed to make the site, the site never went down. Uh, it never crashed. We didn't lose any orders. Um, the most worst bug was that for about three hours, we double charged all the customers. So I had to manually refund like a thousand people. Um, but that was the worst thing that ever happened. That was very scary when it happened, but we were able to fix it very quickly. Um, and so then by July, it kind of felt okay. Um, and right around July, we got a call from the Bookseller Association in the UK. And they were like, oh my God, we love what you guys have done in book with Bookshop in the US. We are terrified that there's going to be a lockdown in the holiday season of 2020. And all of our bookstores are going to go to business. And there are bookstores here that are over 100 years old that don't have any way to sell online. There is no way that they can get it together in time for the holiday season. Is there any way that you guys can launch in the UK before the holidays? Um, and so because like... I hate to say no to something like that. Um, we decided that we were going to launch in the UK. So as soon as things were calm, we started building Bookshop UK and made ourselves insane for an additional four months. Um, and then we launched in Bookshop, launched Bookshop UK in November of 2020. And that did gangbusters right away. And just as I th they thought, there was a lockdown book. We onboarded like 425 bookstores in the UK. Um, for that holiday season and um just like in the US there's a lot of bookstores there in the UK that feel like they wouldn't have survived if bookshop hadn't come along so that was very intense um but fortunately it's it's calmer now that sounds nightmarish but you know I'm glad that uh that you were you able able to keep your sanity uh and and keep the site the site up you know, you know as as it stands uh now you know are there any particular projects that you're working on at Bookshop, uh, or just things in the future that you that you hope to uh, develop? Yeah, um, well, we wanna grow. I mean, it's funny because if you looked at my business plan that I was shopping around in 2019, we are actually way above our optimistic scenario projections, which if you've seen a lot of business plans from startups, that never happens. But it did happen with us. Of course, the pandemic pushed us um, very quickly. So it's probably, you know, a lot of that is because of the pandemic. Um, I like to think we would have succeeded without the pandemic, but the pandemic put some wind in our sails for sure. Um, but I feel like we're still not making a systemic change in the book selling industry, the publishing world. Like we're at about 1% of all the books sold online are sold on bookshop. So that means 99% aren't sold on bookshop of the others, probably between 85 and 95. 90% are sold by Amazon. Some are sold by like thrift books or book deposit. Well, book depository is owned by Amazon. Abe Books is owned by Amazon. So the real true, like the other ones are like Barnes and Noble, which 
we support like I'm I'm happy Barnes and Noble exists and are doing pretty well because those are the local bookstores for some people, um, but it's still tiny and so and twenty eight million dollars which we've raised for local bookstores in the U S is great, but it's not enough for them to like pay a living wage in urban cities or be able to pay for health insurance for all their employees like. What I would really like is for them to have the same market share with online sales as they do in the real world. Um, and that would mean we would grow like five to 10 times from where we are now. And if we could do that, then there would be, first of all, it'd be much easier to open a bookstore. It'd be much easier to make a living as a bookstore owner. Um, bookstore employees could be paid more fairly and um, all together, it would be a really good thing. I'm not sure if we can do it because that would be really, that would be basically saying one out of 20 people who buy books online would choose to support independent bookstores. It's a lot, it's hard to get from one out of a hundred people to one out of 20 people, but that's, that's what broadly, that's what we want to do in the short term. Um, we're doing eBooks right now. So, um, right now there's no way for you to buy an eBook and support an independent bookstore. So I was on vacation two weeks ago. I read Donna Tartt's The Secret History for the first time, which I've been meaning to read for 20 years. Um, I read it on as an ebook. I could not buy it from a local bookstore. I had, I bought it from Kobo and they're, they're nice people, but um, we want a way that people who read ebooks can support their local independent bookstores when they buy those ebooks. And that's 20% of the publishing market right now that independent bookstores are completely excluded from. And a lot of readers will go back and forth. They'll read physical books and they'll read eBooks. It makes no sense that when they read physical books, they can support local bookstores. And when they read eBooks, they can't. So that's the next thing we're doing. And we're launching that in the spring of next year. Yeah. That sounds like a great, uh, you know, a great next step. I think certainly, you know, just supporting these, these bookstores is such a great thing because it's just, you know, especially I remember in high school, for example, you know, I would go to after school all the time, I would just go to bookstores and browse and talk to talk to the, you know, whoever was was keeping the the, the book, the, the bookstore keeper. And I just lo absolutely lo loved it. It was so important for me as a young person, you know, not really knowing what to read to get these recommendations and have people tell me, oh, you got to read Henry Miller. You got to read Don DeLillo. You got to read all these people when, you know, much better than going on Amazon and seeing the top 100 and and try yeah. to find lists that way. You know, you, you mentioned a uh, secret history, but you know, I'm wondering, you know, for you personally, you know, what do you enjoy reading the most? Are there, are there any, any books that you have that are your favorites or things that you've read in the past few months that, uh, that you would really recommend? The writer I'm most excited about is Benjamin Labatud, I think is how you pronounce his last name. He's a Chilean writer. His last book, um, when we cease to understand the world was my favorite book I read last year. His new book is called The Maniac, and it's about John von Neumann, who was a brilliant mathematician who had to flee uh, Eastern Europe because of the Holocaust and um, got settled in the United States, became part of the Manhattan Project, and pioneered um, the central ideas behind artificial intelligence, um, which is extremely topical. Like right now, basically Oppenheimer and AI is what everybody online is talking about. And Benjamin, apparently two years ago, decided that he wanted, or maybe three years, I don't know how long it took him to write the book, but he decided that he wanted to write the, this book about von Neumann. And he's a super interesting writer because he takes historical fact and historical events and historical characters, but he inhabits inner lives and conversation and dialogue. So it's all works of fiction. But um, it's extremely fully imagined and super interesting. It's a little dark and a little smart, um, so it's not necessarily an easy read. But um, when I read when I read those two books, I really remembered like why I love books so much. It was like the ability of a book to to change the way you think about something is like the best for me, like if when you, when a book explodes your consciousness and it doesn't go back into the same shape it was in before, that is the best. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've actually, uh, that author has been recommended to me numerous times because I like books that are mat kind of, you know, novels that have some math component to it or explore mathematical ideas. And if he's been recommended as, as, as an author, that's very, very almost like polymathic in that way. 
Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, for, for independent bookstores, do you have any, uh, any favorite independent bookstores that you enjoy going to, or that you've visited in the past that you, uh, think were particularly remarkable? I'm not allowed to, to play favorites <laughs> like that. I, I feel, feel like you're going to say that. Um, I, yeah. feel, I feel like you would say that. <laughs> I would say, my, you know, my local bookstore is word Brooklyn and Christine, like bookshop wouldn't exist without Christine because Christine had that initial conversation with me. Um, so like she's the butterfly wings that started the um if bookshop's a hurricane she started it and she's my local bookstore so word in brooklyn has definitely got a special place in my heart but i love all kinds of local bookstores i love used bookstores um and you know i love going to since when i was a child every time i go into a new town i love to see if they have a bookstore and what kind of um craziness i can find in there yeah, driving. What I've driven cross country at the United States, cross cross the country twice, and going and finding a local bookstore in a town is one of the the best ways to find find the cool people in the town or find 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 some interesting people because there's always a small bookstore. I mean, maybe not in every single town, of course, but you know, oftentimes there's a look cool local bookstore where they where you find someone there that has has interesting taste that you would never never expect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I was in Nyack. I think it's Nyack, New York, um, which is in upstate New York, and they've got a local bookstore there that is just like insane piles of books everywhere, like stacked to the ceiling, like no visible organizing principle, like stacks, like books piled like three stacks deep. It is just, it 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 feels like you're in a hoarder's house, but it's like so much fun to go through those that is squeezing through aisles that have been made so narrow because the books are overflowing everywhere. It's great. Yeah, those are those are the best types of used bookstores where they kind of uh, blur the line between a store and you know in a an insane person's book collection. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> like they, it is like an episode of Hoarders slash bookstore. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Andy, thank you so much for for being a guest on the New Books Network. Uh, I highly recommend that. If listeners aren't already familiar with bookshop.org, do check it out. I'm sure listeners of New Books Network probably are familiar, uh, but if you haven't signed up, you know, go. It takes you know two minutes to put your 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 information in there. Yeah, Andy, thank you so much. Thank you.